Hello, everyone, and welcome to Children Read To. This panel is part of the Latinx Heritage Month Book Fest, and we are going to hear from some amazing Latinx kid lit authors in the next hour. So I am thrilled to now finally be joined by all of their authors here today. Hello, everyone, yes. and Hello. welcome to. So we have um, this panel yeah. is part of the Latinx Heritage Month Book Fest, and we are going to hear. I'm going to look myself back. Is someone find that in the back? Are you guys good? Okay. <laughs> I heard like an echo. Did we Did we all hear that? Yeah, I heard it. Okay. Maybe. So, um, yeah, I heard it too. Sorry. Yeah. That was my okay, fault. Okay. I was, I I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I have my headphones in, so I don't think it's Okay. We're good. Oh. We're good. It's fine. We're doing great. <laughs> Anyways. So um, like I was saying before I interrupted myself with my echo, <laughs> I'm thrilled to be joined by Zara gonzalez Wang, Anika aldemoy Denise, Mariana Aldanos, and Anika Fajardo. Thank you so much, authors, for being here. I'm excited for all of you to share and discuss your work with us. And on that note, I will start by asking each of you to please introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about your book, and feel free to share the inspiration behind your book if you would like. And we can just start with Anika. <laughs> Which is me. I'm yeah. the Anika, not the Anika. <laughs> yes. Um, I was born in Colombia and raised in Minnesota, and I am the author of, um, let's see, can I get this in here? <laughs> uh, what If a Fish, which just came out in August, and it is about a 11-year-old boy, Eddie Guado, who um, what, is half Colombian and half Minnesotan, and he's growing up in Minnesota trying to figure out where he belongs. So it's very autobiographical. Um, this is my second book. My first book was a memoir called Magical Realism for Non-Believers, a memoir of finding family, which was basically the same kind of story about figuring out where you belong and who you are and how to navigate the two worlds of um, the Latinx world for me, Colombia and um, Minnesota, in, especially Minnesota in the 80s, super white, very homogenous community. Um, and then I, so now I've been a librarian, a teacher. Uh, I teach an MFA program right now and I build websites for artists. Nice, love that. Zara? Um, hi, I'm Zara um, and I am an author and illustrator of uh, the book, A New Kind of Wild. Oops. Um, it is my author illustrator debut and it's about a boy who moves from Puerto Rico to New York and it's based on inspired by my dad who um, was born in Puerto Rico and moved to New York as a kid and I grew up in Minnesota strangely there's two bus from Minnesota but I grew up in Minnesota again land of very homogeneity of homogeneity with um, a dad who just told these colorful, wonderful, magical stories about Puerto Rico and growing up there, and then also about New York, um, this magical city. Um, and it just really inspired me. And I, I feel like it shaped a lot of my, um, uh, I don't know, thought process about self and identity growing up to have all this, this magical storytelling around me. So that's me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anika, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I an, Anika, not Anika. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really Pardon. cool to have another person <laughs> in the panel who spells their name like me. Um, and it's finally, it's nice to meet you. Like, <laughs> we've been, I've been stalking you online. <laughs> me too. For a long time. Um, actually, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. I'm a big fan of all of your work. So thank you for including me. Thank you, Adri. Um, so I'm a picture book author. Uh, I write lots of different kinds of picture books, but um, probably most known for um, Planting Stories, The Life of Librarian and Storyteller, Pura Bel Prey. And my newest book, it's actually, it's not a book. I don't have a copy of it yet. <laughs> this is um, a printout, but I have it here <laughs> to remind me that it's a book and it's coming um, of a girl named Rosita. I don't know how to, my, here we go, that way. Um, and it, it's the, um, the story of Rita Moreno, actor, singer, dancer, trailblazer. So I really love writing about powerhouse trailblazing uh, Puerto Rican women. Mm. And um, I grew, yeah, <laughs> I grew up um, in New York, and uh, I, you know, Rita Moreno is like someone. I feel like Puerto Ricans are really um, 
when we, there's a celebrity or somebody well known who is Puerto Rican, we uh, root for them and always follow their career. And it's like, oh, she's she's Puerto Rican, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. um, and so, of course, a uh, big fan of of Rita. I loved the performing arts when I was a kid too. My mom used to get back when TKTS, the the ticket booth that you can get half price tickets. It first started as a mail order thing where you could become a member of it, and they would mail you subscriptions to see shows. And so we didn't have money to go to a Broadway show, but this was one way we would get like those last minute tickets that were really cheap. And so my mom would take me. And so I grew up loving seeing performing, you know, the performing arts and seeing live theater. Um, I was in my school plays and, and uh, of course loved the film West Side Story, would sing it into my hairbrush in the mirror <laughs> and pretend I didn't have a good singing voice, but that didn't stop me. And um, and so I've always been a fan of, of Rita's and she was definitely, there just were not many um, Latina in entertainment, especially that became like a household name. Um, so she was someone who I, I thought, even though, um, Kids might not remember her on like the electric company. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> hey, you, hey, you guys! Like, you know, she's so iconic. But they would relate to her story of everything that um, she was able to accomplish. She came um, here from Puerto Rico when she was five. You know, modest means and really reached the pinnacle of success. Um, so, and I love that she's also somebody who really gives back to her community. So she's a role model in many ways for me. And I was thrilled when Leo Espinosa agreed to illustrate because he did such a good job of, of bringing her story to life in his art. Love it. And Mariana? Well, hi, I am Mariana Llanos and I write uh, children's books. Um, so far, I well, I started my career self-publishing. So I've self-published nine books. And then uh, in the meantime, I decided to kind of research traditional publishing too and see what was th that all about. And, and um, well, I joined SCBWI and all of, you know, I started joining the groups and everything. So I pursued traditional publishing. And in 2019, my first book, traditionally published book came out. It was Lucas Bridge, it's, uh, this one, and it's a story about uh, deportation, immigration, a boy who is deported to Mexico. And um, it was well received, you know, so I was very happy about that. You always, you know, very nervous when you talk about these kind of uh, things, right? And um, then my second book with the same publisher, Penny Candy Books, came out this year. That's Eunice and Kate, this one. Yeah. And um, yeah. I just announced my next book that is with Barefoot Books, and it's called Run Little Chesky. It's a story uh, about the royal messengers in Peru in the Inca times. Mm -hmm. And I am originally from Peru. I don't think I said that. I'm originally from Lima, Peru. I moved to the United States um, about 18, 19 years ago. And I live in Oklahoma. And um, I want to live close to the ocean next time. You know, and I don't live in Minnesota, you know, so I think everybody talks about Minnesota, right? But I don't, I've never been there. Yeah. <laughs> Nice. Well, I didn't no, say where I was from. That. I'm from the ocean state, so come live here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I live in Rhode Island. Now. <laughs> wow. uh, so thank you for all of that. And if any of their books sound interesting to you, they're all linked in the description down below. So feel free to check that out at any time. I noticed I forgot to introduce myself because I guess I just took it for granted because I assume if you're here, you know who I am. But my name is Adri. I am a queer, trans, non-binary, Mexican-American book reviewer. This is my channel, Perpetual Pages, where I shout about books on the internet. But you're not here to hear about me. I just remembered that I did not say who I was. So that's who I am in all of this. Um, and we will go on from there and start talking about your books. So all of your books, in some measure, explore how culture impacts our relationships with our friends and our families. So how do you think your culture or your background influenced the way you approach those topics in your books? And we'll just go around in the same order. So Annika, you can start. Oh, great. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, I, I started writing my book when I couldn't get my memoir published, actually. Um, and I really wanted to, I really needed to tell this story about um, half siblings and about sort of the split between um, the Colombian side and the Minnesota side um, and and kind of that longing and searching feeling 
So I basically started plagiarizing myself. Like I took, I always feel like funny to say like, I took the emotional core of my memoir, which sounds very fancy, <laughs> and just like plopped it into this story that I had already written about, um, about this boy and his much older half brother and they share the same name. And, and there was something about names and about this idea of kind of back and forth. My, my, um, my own half brother, my dad, my nephew, my great uncle all have the same um, name. And I realized I had this moment where I was like, if I had been born a boy, I would have been named the same name. And then my brother and I would have the same name. And, and I think that having the same name is really common in Latinx cultures. Like that's not something super rare, but I think in American culture, it's much, much more rare that you would have the same name as your sibling and, and how much that name that kind of, kind of inform your identity when you're growing up. For me, I always felt like my name was this bizarre, um, just like someone had taken some letters and thrown them onto the table. And that was my name because when I was growing up, no one had ever heard of either my first name or my last name couldn't pronounce any of it. I didn't have a middle name either when I was a kid. And so that was like extra weird. It was just like too many weirdnesses. And so I'm really just fascinated by how, what we call ourselves um, informs our identify our identities and where we come from and what we look like and all these different pieces all come together. So that's what I'm hoping to show in this book. Nice. Um, so I think I'm next. Yes. Um, so my book, um, well, it started from a place actually, maybe a little strange for a picture book, but it started from a place of grief because I wrote this book actually after my dad passed away. I was feeling really kind of adrift. And um, because I'm a, a white passing uh, Latina, I, um, and, and I'm mixed too. So, you know, my mom is white. Um, and uh, I always felt like, because I passed that the one thing that really like, tied me to my identity and my culture was my dad. And when he passed away, I just felt really disconnected from it. And I went through like this, uh, just, it was like a frenzy. Like I, I felt like I needed to do something that really spoke about um, Latini dad and, and also about like the diaspora in the sense, you know, moving from a place where you're embedded in that culture to someplace where you're not. And so I think that's really the genesis of, of where this idea came from. And then, you know, of course my dad moved from, did move from Puerto Rico to New York when he was a kid. And I had grown up hearing all of those stories, but also hearing the longing in his voice when he talked about Puerto Rico and, and, and how much he missed it. And like, um, for whatever reason, we didn't go back much when when we were growing up, but to the, to the day he died, like Puerto Rico was his home. You know, he may have lived in New York and loved New York and lived in Minnesota and loved Minnesota, but there was just something about that that homeland, that like place that he came from, and that magic that he found there that colored everything. So that was really my inspiration, and I feel like. I just don't feel like you can divorce culture and background from your writing. Like, even if you're not specifically writing about it, like I was in the sense that I was, you know, paying homage to, to Puerto Rico and the place where my dad lived and also to New York in the place that um, my dad and actually my mom lived as well. But, um, but, you know, even just since I'm an illustrator too, in the things that I draw in the like, you know, if there's a kitchen, the type of things that are in the kitchen or, you know, the, the, you know, I tried to capture the, the the feeling of like you know the i think the beauty of of urban places as well as you know uh the um el yunque which is where uh my dad was born around there so i tried to capture the beauty of both because i don't i didn't think that one was better than the other you know there's magic in both of them and and i feel like the way that my parents talked about New York and the love that they had for it, and then also the love that my dad from had from Puerto Rico just seeped into there. So it's really, to me, uh, my book was a love letter to both Puerto Rico, to New York, and kind of to the di uh, diaspora of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Anika? Or Anika? Um, okay, so that made me very choked up hearing that story. <laughs> I know, like um, that's beautiful. and. It's amazing, uh, Zara and I have talked about this, that my experience is very similar. Um, my dad is 
Puerto Rican, was Puerto Rican. He passed away. Um, my mom Italian. So I don't know if you can see Zara's shirt, but it says pasteles on it. And mine would say pasteles y pasta. <laughs> because that's both of me. Um, but in New York, obviously growing up in New York, my the Puerto Rican side of my family all lived in New York. Um, slowly they've kind of sprinkled out, but there's still some of us still there. And um, so my heart is in New York and was very close to that side of my family. I look like my dad. So I always identified very strongly with the with the Puerto Rican side. Not that I wasn't close to the other side too. I mean, I really had the beauty of both, but, but I think, um, you know, I always identified as, as Puerto Rican sort of first and foremost for some reason. And um, because you're Puerto Rican and that's what. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, but like people would be like, I'd be like, oh yeah, and I'm Italian too. Like, I don't know why I always said that first. It just, it was just how I felt. It was just how I felt, you know? Um, and similarly, as I was researching the Bel Pre book, um, in, the, in the midst of it, uh, my father got sick and he passed very quickly and, and it was shocking. Um, but I was kind of intimidated to do the book. I was doing the research and my agent was excited for it. And I thought, oh, this is, she's so important to the entire Latinx community that I really wanted to do right by it. And I, I got a little bit of stage fright, I think about it. And then my dad passed away and all of a sudden I had this like urgent need to finish the book. And also um, he was raised by my Titi uh, and his grandmother and uh, she, when I told her I was doing this, she was like grieving a son when he passed, even though she was his aunt, it was like she raised him. And we would talk a lot on the phone and um, I told her I was doing this book and it lifted her so much. And she started talking about Pura Del Prey and how she, when she came, she didn't speak any English. And this was the first book that was put in front of her that she could really identify with. And and it just like opened this floodgates on not just the memories of of um, that, but also memories of my father when he was a little kid. And I, everything was telling me to finish this book. And I did it for Titi, I did it for Pura, I did it for my father. Um, and then when I was thinking about the next book to write about about Rita, I mean, my dad was a huge Rita Moreno fan, you know, <laughs> like, so it was, um, it was a natural for me to want to write about her. And um, I also had the opportunity accident. I accidentally met her. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. yeah, I tell a story where um, I was visiting actually the other side of the family in upstate New York, and she came to my um, aunt's house because they were hosting her because she was at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center doing something. And we had a friend who worked there and they called and they're like, can you take her out? They, they have a, like an old antique wooden boat and they're like, Rita would love to go and be out on the lake and, and get a little tour. Can you take her out? And I was, my kids were really little, <laughs> like sticky little, you know what I mean? Like we were a mess that day and we were swimming over there and I was not dressed. I had a towel around me and whatever. And my aunt goes, hey, uh, Rita Moreno's coming over. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she's gonna come out for a boat ride. And I was like, I'm a mess. Like the kids are, and, and it was pretty funny. And I remember that after she left and they, she of course looked gorgeous, you know, she's all dressed up and um, and they went and put putted away from the dock and me and the kid, the kid, one kid is like crawling up me, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> waving and I'm like, okay. And I immediately called my father and said, you're not going to believe who I just met, you know? So um, that's my, that's my Rita Moreno story, but he was the first person I wanted to tell. And I know he would love um, that I did this book about her. So. It's wonderful. I love that story. Mariana? <laughs> yes. Well, um, first you're probably going to notice a lot of uh, that I'm talking <laughs> sometimes. Um, there's a lot of things going on here because I have two teenagers, a little one, and robotics today. I'm baking empanadas while we're talking. So, you know, I'm, I coordinate a lot of things. So that's part, I guess, of yeah. my culture too. That is my books, you know, so I, um, all the time because um, for me, well, I guess for, you know, uh, most of us, you know, always um, everybody, you know, being a mother or being a parent, it, it's super important and it's, you know, part of our lives. And um, for mm -hmm. me, writing is my oasis, you know, so it, it's the thing that it's mine for myself, you know, uh, and something that comes from my head and only mine, you know, so, uh, and even though, you know, it has a bit, some pieces of everything, uh, it's only mine and the, the moment where I, you know, um, where I'm, you know, I'm just myself, you know, I allow to be just myself. I know 
somebody's mom only, you mm. know, so, which I love, of course, you know, I love it. It's, you know, it's my life, but um, I, I love to have this little um, oasis. So, um, and actually I started writing in, in the United States because, um, because of my kids, you know, so it was because of them. And I, I think I've always been a writer since I was very young. I wrote, I was a child writer and I was, you know, very, very nerdy, you know, I'm very proud of it, you know, so always with my book and always with my, my notepad. And, and, and I remember a, a birthday, I think I was turning eight or nine and, and my dad gave me a um, agenda, like a leather agenda. And I think someone gave it to him from, because he was a journalist or so the you know TV station where he worked, someone gave it to him and he gave it to me. And um, you know, so and that was my most precious gift. It had, you know, a, a notepad and a pen and I just, you know, loved it because I could write some poems on it. So, um, so, and then when I moved to the United States, kind of every, all my writing and all the artistic interests that I had kind of went to the back of my head because I was for the first time alone, well, with my husband, you know, so I was alone and, um, you know, and I had to work, we had to survive, uh, you know, so everything shifted completely. And then I had children and, you know, you don't have family around to help you raise them or anything, you're alone, you know, so uh, it, it was very hard. But then I noticed a few years into being a mother, noticed that something was missing and that piece missing was me, it was myself, you know, so I, I adored, you know, being a mom, it, it's my life, it's, it's, you know, yeah. But um, um, when my children, but I was always thinking when my children grow up, when they ask me, mom, so what do you do? What you know, so I want, you know, I wanted them to feel proud of me, you know, so, um, and then I remembered, I used to be a writer. I was writing, I wasn't even reading, you know, I used to be a writer. I mean, that doesn't go away, it, it's there. So that thing came like a storm, you know, it came back like a storm and I just began writing and writing. And that's why I, I think I self-published first because I was just in a, in a rush to, to get this thing moving. And the traditional publishing would have, Taking, you know, like we all know, you know, like forever. So, <laughs> yeah. so I was in a rush to just get going. So uh, my culture, my kids, my parents, my family is always there in the background uh, of my books. Uh, when I did Lucas Bridge and when I decided that I wanted to pursue traditional publishing with this, it was because um, the subject was a little bit too heavy, like immigration and this family being deported. So I knew I I would need someone to back me up on that, you know, not, mm -hmm. not just me, you know. So um. So yeah, so this uh, publisher Penny Candy books are amazing, and um, you know they took on the the project, and, and you know and I think it turned out to be a beautiful book. Now I didn't do about a Peruvian family; it was a Mexican family. I chose to make it more fiction. No, I didn't want to do it more, you know, close to me. But I think this book was born a little bit of always the fear and anxiety of immigration. You know, when you are getting your papers and you go to your interviews and everything, and everything is so you know so, so <laughs> i don't know if people who haven't been through the process understand but it's always you know anxiety what if they don't accept my application you know for, for residency you know so yeah because that's a possibility so that's something that happens to this family you know that they they you know they have to leave mm -hmm. and their children were born in the united states just like my children you know so i was always with that okay what if they tell you okay no 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 no, we don't take you here, you know, go, go. So what would happen? So it was a what if with uh, Lucas Bridge, right? Mm -hmm. And and then um, with Eunice and Kate, I got more uh, the inspiration of the things that were going on around us. And in that moment, uh, I remember it was um, a lot of um, protests because of these killings, uh, uh, you know, police brutality and all that. So um, when I, I was, you know, my heart was aching because I was thinking of people here on the streets, kind of, you know, showing hate to each other, you know, and it, it's horrible. And then in the meantime, the kids go to school and they have friends of all colors and they play at recess and they hug each other and they don't care, you know. And then when they grow up, they realize the world is messed up. So um, so that was, you know, that was a big part of my inspiration behind uh, Eunice and Kate. When, um, when it was taken by Penny Candy Book, we decided to make some changes because the story at the beginning was about race. It was very much on your face, uh, race. So we decided to make some changes and make it more about friendship. And, uh, you know, I loved how it turned out being about, you know, respect to girls who respect each other and who learn to respect each other and to mothers who are, who respect each other, even though they're, they're you know, might look different, 
but the struggles are essentially the same and that, that's how I feel and, and uh, you know, about everything. And then with the next book with Chesky, I'm using uh, everything, the knowledge that I have about Inca culture and all the things that make me proud about uh, coming from Peru and, and our historical wealth that we have and cultural wealth that we have and bring it here because I don't think people realize, you know, when I, you know, here I speak Spanish or, oh, are you from Mexico? Nah, I'm not, I'm not again, you know, so I mean, I love Mexico, but, you, you know, I'm not from Mexico. And yeah. I've had the, you know, typical, uh, okay, what part of Mexico is, uh, is Peru, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I mean, from college educated people, you know. So uh, that and that's the most terrible part, right? Like, did you miss class? Did you see <laughs> regularly? You know. So those things. So that that you know, it's very important for me to to have that part of myself in the upfront. And I love this moment we're living now, where we are allowed to bring our stories out. You know. So I, I think years ago probably writers had to kind of um go you know uh fit what they were supposed to write about right so i think nowadays we're living in a moment where multicultural books and, and you know books about race and, and you know so many other things are are important and are being appreciated so it's it's super nice you know to be in this moment to be a writer in this moment yes i love that and yeah, that's something I loved about all of your books because it took me back to when I was a kid and like we didn't really get to see these parts of all these different Latinx cultures reflected in children's books, especially. So I definitely feel like we're in a moment where we're bringing it out more now. And I'm very appreciative of that. Also, we have a lot of people admiring the Latinx chaos <laughs> that Mariana brought up, <laughs> which is very big mood. I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> I felt that when you spoke about it everyone in your house doing everything. And we've all talked backstage about how we banish our family to other parts of the house because that's just how it is. We could not do this otherwise. We could have so, a panel uh, about that actually. Um, good. <laughs> so we kind of touched on this a little bit in the last question, but I would love to know a little bit more about what specific parts or aspects of your culture, if any, did you want to like consciously bring into your work and how did you go about that? Did you have to do any research or is it just something that came naturally to you? You know, how did that factor into your stories? And we'll start again with Annika. <laughs> oh, look at me. Um, <laughs> well, so growing up um, when, so for, there was a time in my childhood where I um, was really proud of being Colombian. I didn't grow up with my dad. In fact, I didn't meet him until I was 21. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, it, he had been my primary caregiver when I was a baby and then my parents got divorced. So I had like, I must've had like this background, you know, something in me that was remembered Columbia and remembered him and everything. Um, so I, there was a lot of time in my childhood where I was really proud and I would like do my school reports out, you know, when it was a country report, I would always do Columbia and my mom would help me. My mom is American, but she, but she lived in Columbia for five years. So she would help me like make manja blanco or something really, really hard like that. <laughs> um, and so I felt really proud. And then in middle school and into high school, it started to be like, oh, you must do drugs. You must have cocaine. You must have, do you drink coffee? Like all uh, like, just like all the negative things started to come out. And I was like, oh my God, this thing that I thought made me special was actually making me, making people not like me or not, you know, disrespect me. And it was such a shock, like that piece of it was such a surprise to me because I thought this was this kind of magical thing. Um, and so I really consciously, so I, so of course I knew the book had to, the, the boy had to go to Columbia. And I really wanted him to show us how beautiful Columbia is and how the stereotypes, the negative stereotypes, like those things are there, but they don't define Columbia. And, and it was really important to me because I, I think that the, the images of Columbia are getting better now than they were back in the 80s and 90s and 2000. Um, but there's still just like this idea that, you know, it's dangerous and it's, you know, backward and whatever. Um, so I wanted to show just the, you know, that they have Wi-Fi and they have delicious food and you can go swimming. 
and mm. you can have ice cream and like all these all these good things too and and still the reality um of, and there's still some reality of some of the things that make make it a super different country from minnesota <laughs> yeah. not that minnesota is a country but it has <laughs> so <laughs> i lived in california and i realized like oh minnesota is kind of its own country like <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so just kind of showing showing all of those pieces is really important. Love that. Zada? Um, so, I, don't, I mean, what parts of my culture did I bring into this book? I mean, obviously, you know, it's it's a story of, that's based on reality. So, you know, the I brought my dad's, you know, life into it a bit, um, you know, the he he was born in the in the mountains um in uh puerto rico and san lorenzo but like in a small like time and, and he was also born in like the late 1930s so it was very very uh, uh small and he used to tell me stories about like running around barefoot and like riding the the horse to school and like stuff like that but um i i wanted to capture some of that um that, that feeling of just like being in the country and just the love for, and the freedom that he had um, as a kid, just running through the the, the forest and, and right in his um, grandmother's uh, uh, place that she lived. And uh, so I guess, you know, I tried to bring that in. And then when they moved to New York, um, I feel like a lot of like city or country books, like, you know, kind of like city to country books or country to city books, they they try and vilify one place or the other. So it seems like one place is better than the other, but I don't really feel like that. I, you know, I feel like both places are equally special and magical. And I really wanted to show that depending on where you're from, you know, the place that you're most familiar with is obviously going to be the one that is the most special to you. And so I kind of wanted to show this contrast and also show like how, you know, if if you start to, you know, give a place the opportunity, it'll kind of show your magic or show you its, its magic. And so, I don't know, I guess just even the idea of magic and magic being everywhere was something that I feel like is really embedded in our, our culture as uh, Latinx people. Um, you know, there's the the magical realism, like idea, some would call it a trope, but it's like, it's so rooted in the reality of life. It's not, it's like some people call it like fiction or fantasy like this idea of magical realism but it's it's just so embedded in the culture it's it's not any of those things it's it's like reality like mm -hmm. um and i guess i just i wanted to bring some of that that aspect that that poetic nature and that 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 magic into uh my book so if, if that's part of culture i guess that's that's kind of the heart of what i was trying to do yeah oh, that makes complete sense and I agree, your magical realism is very much embedded in our culture. So, Anika? Um, so for me, I think the both of mine are nonfiction books, although I do have a series called um, Starring Carmen um, about a family that's very much looks like the family <laughs> that I grew up with. <laughs> um, but for, for the two nonfiction books, they're both in some ways about great storytellers and uh, Puerto Ricans, and I think many Latinx backgrounds, um, storytelling is such a big part of our culture. So telling the story of Pura del Prey and how she took the folk tales that she heard growing up and really because of her, um, we ha still have them. I mean, they could get lost. They were not in the library. And she knew that if somebody didn't write them down and they weren't available in books that they would, these families that have come from Puerto Rico would, would lose that. And they're too important and they're too colorful and they're too magical. Um, and, and I know that storytelling was part of my, my growing up with that family and that side of my family. It was like, yeah, we, and, and it wasn't even just like folktale storytelling. It was like, let me tell you about what happened. And it always was amazing <laughs> the ability <laughs> to capture and also the Spanglish was fantastic. <laughs> you know, the mixing and the 
going back and forth in languages, it just was a storytelling like I hadn't, um, that I never heard anywhere else is not the same, you know, for me. And, you know, you can hear a, a Hans Christian Andersen tale and those are good, but there's something fundamentally different and beautiful to me about um, stories that are told from a Latinx perspective and in our way. <laughs> so uh, I guess that's my, and you, Zara, you mentioned love letter. And so like mm -hmm. by talking about two of these women who are, I mean, Rita was is a performance storyteller too, right? She tells stories through her dance and her acting and her choices. And um, and so it, it, I guess that's how they those two books connect for me. And that's what I particularly love is like elevating and amplifying storytellers. Beautiful. Mariana? Well, um, I do a lot of uh, research when I write my books, and that's, you know, for me, it's fundamental because I always have this fear that someone's going to come and tell me, oh, you got that wrong. You know, so, yeah, uh, and you know, so that's really terrifying. I don't know, I think I have good nightmares about that. But, and, um, you know, so I read a lot, and now that I'm, you know, um, writing some historical, um, actually one uh, fiction, actually one of the books that I self-published, it was a historical fiction too. Um, so I was a little uh, Inca princess. So, you know, so I've been reading a lot, a lot about, you know, uh, books, uh, you know, historical books uh, and history and, and all that. And so for me, it's super important to have that part, part of history right, because it, it, it I think it honors also the people from, from the region of the Andes to get their history right and to have the author, uh, you know, uh, doing doing the work, right? So, um, and for any of the books that I, that, that I write, I try to do some, some research and try to talk to people from, you know, who have lived those experiences. So, uh, um, you know, I think I write fiction, but I also have that, um, the duty to get things things right so um you know so yeah so that that's my that's my biggest thing to read 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 and, and, and absorb as much knowledge as i have as i can so i can pour that into my into my books yes oof that yeah imposter syndrome that's huge i don't even know if you call it that just like that feeling where it's like do i have am i getting my own culture correct <laughs> like yes, I don't know my own history. I, yeah my own history i grew up with it but sometimes i get like you know especially because you know you read now in these times i mean the in, inter, internet and information it's a blessing but it's also a curse as well because there's so much and uh, such a wealth of, of, of information that you know, it's hard to sometimes to tell who is, you know, right <laughs> or not, yes. or what's serious and what is not. On my research, for example, for Chasky and for the, all, some other books that I'm writing, um, I did, um, I came up uh, to a lot of blogs and, mm. you know, sometimes I'm like, is this your personal opinion or is this a really scientifically researched yes. Um, yes. Uh, statement? You know, so, so when I find something that I really like, then I have to go find if there's a source for that. You know, because I don't want to, oh, well, somebody on the internet said that Incas, you know, dance the cha-cha-cha or something, you know, so, you know, so, but, but you do find that kind of stuff, you know, so, so, so for me, it's very Ma important to get it. Mariana, what do you call uh, the, this one? <laughs> oh, eso es el, um, well, jellyfish, I was going to say. Very good, <laughs> <Right. laughs> English. Oh, that's a jellyfish. No, um, a, um. Medusa. I have, I don't remember, but yeah. I'm gonna remember. Okay. So no, I'm gonna tell you. Malaguas. 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 Yes. yes. So Malaguas. I was in Cartagena with my family, my Colombian family, but my sister-in-law is from Peru, and we got my my husband got bit by malaguas, and so I had we love this word so much, malaguas. We came home saying it all the time, and then I put it in the book, and the copy editor was like. I've never heard of this word, and no one would agree that it was malaguas. It's a malagua, of course. What else I, would I think only in Peru, and so I had my cultures oh. mixed up because it was my sister-in-law who was calling it malaguas, mm -hmm. and oh, Melusa, yeah. Um, so now we called it aguas malas, is what we came up with. Oh, okay. Well, so. if you if I read aguas malas, I would never uh, know. I mean, I would <laughs> think that it's some water that was, you know, in 
you know some place so yeah no it, it's that's you know very interesting because even though we are come from spanish speaking countries we all have different words for things and sometimes we're like what are you talking about yeah that? and you yes. grow up with your own kind of words and it's a mix of whoever is all in the room together and that, that's true yes. and that's a cross between everything right that, <laughs> that's, that's why we need all of these books by all of us and anybody else who wants to write books because i feel like I mean, we say it all the time, but Latinx people are not a monolith. Mm -hmm. We're we're so different, and even within you know Puerto Rican culture, or Peruvian culture, or Colombian culture, it's like Mexican culture. Like depending on where you're from, what yes. little pocket, like everything is different, and your family might have been influenced by you know, maybe their ancestors immigrated from somewhere else, or like I'm Jewish, and like mm -hmm. so my experience with things is different than other Puerto Ricans who are not Jewish. Um, anyway, I, I, we just, we all need to keep writing and we need to write everything so that we don't, uh, we don't have to fear that we're getting our own culture right because it, because yes. it is right to us. Mm -hmm. we, and we don't have to be, hopefully someday, we won't have to be, you know, the authority on whatever it is that we're writing because we're just writing about our experience, just like, white people or whatever write about their experiences you know mm -hmm. and, and just because you're white doesn't mean that your experience is the exact same person you know if you were born in minnesota versus california or whatever someday we'll get there right oh, God. <laughs> so that yes. makes, that's what makes me sort of crazy when i hear like okay an editor not any others that we work with because we all love our editors <laughs> but like i've heard people say like well i already have this you know um Puerto Rican writer writing fantasy mm. on my list. Like, okay, so you so you check oh. that box, like right. you know, it's the, <laughs> that's the kind it just speaks to that kind of oh, idea yeah. that there's a limited number and okay, so cross that off. I have that on my list. Let me move on and find something else. Like, yeah. Anyway. Yes, <laughs> we are all gonna have the same experience, right? Right, so, right. Coming from the same even in, in Peru, you know, so I'm I'm from Lima. You know, so there are many things that are different in the different regions of Peru. And even in Lima, that is such a big city, you will have different experiences to depend on if you're really from the city or from the outside of Lima. You know, so there's so many, many different uh, experiences that you can, you know, that you can be. Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. And it's just like Zara said, that's exactly why y'all need to keep writing. All of us need to keep writing so that um, we get through all that gatekeeping. Because, yeah, it's like publishing, there's gatekeeping there. And then we gatekeep each other. Mm -hmm. It's wild out here. <laughs> just, we just need more Latinx voices. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> so um, kind of to refocus on your books, I was also interested in knowing what calls you to write for younger audiences? Like, why do you feel like this story that we're here to talk about today would speak to younger readers specifically? Annika? So I had I had an editor, a hired editor that I had when I was working on my memoir and because it took me nine years to get it published. So it had been through many, many, many heartbreak and revisions and rewrites. And I hired somebody who broke my heart, but also built me up. She told me like, your memoir's probably never gonna get published. <laughs> I was wow. horrible. And then one of the chapters is written from my point of view as a child. And she said, but that, that is what you should be writing. Mm -hmm. And I had this idea and, and she told me, um, you need to write for the, the one kid that needs to hear your story. And I kind of kept that in my head the whole time. Like there is the one child who is confused and he doesn't know where he belongs. He has one parent for some reason. He is lost in this world where he believes everything's good and all of a sudden everything isn't as good as it seems. And so I, I just like keep that, keep that kid in my heart the whole time. And it's what keeps me going. And part of it is it's me when I was a kid, definitely. I mean, I, I look at my, I have all my old journals. I started when I was in fourth grade. And so I can look back and see like, so such confusion. <laughs> um, and I mean, I have those memories too of just like what, what it felt like. But I know that, you know, whoever publishes or doesn't publish or reviews or doesn't reviews or doesn't give me stars, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, there's that kid that it's gonna reach. There's gonna be at least one kid. And so that is what keeps me going. 
my heart. Yes. <laughs> Zada? I mean, my answer is so similar. I mean, I write the stories that I wish I had been able to read as a child. There were no um, Puerto Rican stories like, you know, the one that I wrote, write, the one that I wrote, the one that Anika, the ones that Anika, you know, wrote, like stories about Puerto Rican kids. Like, I mean, they were great. Like Pura wrote beautiful stories. And I, you know, I have, I'm lucky enough to have like an old copy of, of some of her stories. And, you know, we had tons of, of, of stories from Puerto Rico, but nothing about being Puerto Rican in the U.S., you know, or or having to to move, make that traumatic move um, from, I mean, Puerto Rico is technically part of the U.S., but, you know, from essentially a new country, you know, from one country to another, you know, you know, that that's such like a huge event in a child's life. And it really shapes them and shapes their um, perspective on things. And so, I, I mean, that's that's why I wanted to write this story, but in general, it's just, I, I really wanted to write what I was missing and that's what I continue to write. And I, I hope that I have a long career, like being able to continue to write that because there's so many stories to write. And I, I think that they're so needed and I hope everybody, you know, people listening or, you know, and obviously the other authors, like I hope we all continue to write because these stories are just so, I mean, even now reading them, like I'm not a child anymore and I read these and I get so choked up and, and like, I feel it because it, it was just, it's needed, it's needed. And I, and I get to read them to my kids and that's just so amazing. So I, I, that's why I write for kids and why I continue to write. Yes, not to interrupt, but we got this wonderful comment from Caro. It says, I wish I'd had the chance to read all these Latinx children's books when I was younger. It would have been life changing for me. So there's fuel for the fire. There's your motivation as you continue to do your work. And I totally agree, Caro. So thank you for sharing that. And now uh, Anika. So my answer is also very similar. I write for the kid. I write the books that I wanted and didn't have as a kid. Um, interestingly, as an adult, I made my way to more books that were available that I didn't, that I didn't know. Um, I had a librarian in high school who just pushed the classics, right? There was a few New Yorkian writers. Um, Nicolosa Moore is like somebody who I never, ever read her books growing up. And I can't believe I didn't know who she was or that her books existed. So <clears throat> I think part of that too, just as, well, I don't know if this is answering the question or not, <laughs> was like, if those books are, um, it's what books are elevated because, you know, especially, you know, it, New York and culture, there is poets and writers and rich going back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Why didn't I have access to them? Why didn't I know that they existed? So it's partly that I want to write books for me and I want, I want to get them through <laughs> the gatekeeping process so that my all of our books are are promoted equally alongside of the classics you know mm -hmm. that frankly some of them are pretty problematic you know it's 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 a whole big complicated thing but <laughs> but it is. um but i i guess i it's so powerful you know the, the picture book age and the middle grade reading age is such a powerful time like reading a story that can change you. If I had seen those books, if a librarian had put them in front of me, I really think it can change the trajectory of your life. Like that's how important it is. It sounds so dramatic to say, but it's, um, it, it's a really important time. So that's why I take, I love it. It's just also, I love writing this genre. It's just my favorite. And, um, and also I, I recognize the responsibility of how important it is, so. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mariana? Um, well, I think I write uh, for kids because um, I really never grew up, you know, so I write for my, it's my, you know, inside who writes, you know, so, and also I'm very small, so, you know, that's also literally, but, you know, but, um, you know, but that's how I feel, you know, when I write, it, it's that child inside myself that is still there, that is still um, needs to express herself, you know, who is writing, so, um 
Um, and I never set out to write for kids, honestly. Um, I just kind of wrote. And uh, when I wrote the first story that I self-published, that it was called Tristan Wolf. And it's a story that I really love. Maybe one day I will go back to it and make it, you know, with all the knowledge that I have now, you know, make it a little bit more uh, marketable. <laughs> I don't know. But, um, you know, but uh, it is a, a really nice story, in, at least in my opinion. So when I wrote it, and I was very self-conscious because I wrote it in English and not in Spanish. That was the very first uh, the story I had written in English. I showed it to a friend of mine. And I said, hey, why, why don't you tell me? And she, she's from here. She's from Oklahoma. And, um, and she, you know, she read it. And she said, oh, Mariana, this is beautiful. You know, you could write. Then she told me, my kids would love to read this. And that's when, oh. You know, so I... Up to that moment, I had not realized that I wrote for children, you know, so mm -hmm. like in that concept, right? yes, well, you know, characters are children and the situations, you know, so um, it was in that moment that I realized, okay, well, yes, I do write children's stories. And um, I don't think I ever want to try other genre, you know, of course, I am writing middle grade and I'm trying to do other things, but, uh, you know, grownups are not fun, so why would I... <laughs> Honestly, you know, so why would I want to write for <laughs> for adults? So yeah, that, that's what I love. That's what I love writing, and it uh, just allows me to explore so much of my imagination. And yeah, so that's a big thing for me. That's true. Yes, but not to make generalizations, but adult fiction, there's a lot of suffering in adult <laughs> fiction. So, but yes, it's just like all of you are saying. It's a, a very informative time in young readers' lives. So. I, I love that and I love that you all are creating for them. So um, to kind of like round out our discussion, obviously we're here to celebrate Kid Lit and Latinx Kid Lit specifically. So what are some other Latinx creators in the young reader space who influence or inspire your work? Or are there any Latinx children's titles that you really love and would love to recommend? We would love to hear about it. Uh, so again, we'll start with Anika. I just am in the middle, almost done with Return to Sender by Julia Alvarez. Um, and so I'm really enjoying that one. I, I'm working on a book that's from two points of view. And so I'm loving that one because it's it's uh, letters and then another point of view from two kids. Um, and then I really loved um, uh, The Other Half of Happy recently. Also read that one, great one. I mean, basically any like half and half book, I'm. <laughs> Give me all the give me all the mixed kids, please. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Zara. Um, so uh, you know, I don't I don't write middle grade or YA, but I read a lot of it. Um give it to and, all of us. Give it. <laughs> uh, like Anika, I also any book about a mixed child is like what I am looking for. So other half of happy or the other side of happy and um your book, Anika. Uh I am super excited to start reading that. Um, and also uh, the book Color Me In by Natasha Diaz, because yes. not only is it about a mixed race child, it's also about a Jewish one. And so mm -hmm. that was my, you know, uh, um, my family ranges in skin color. I'm the lightest one. And so like my family going to temple as, a, as kids and being accepted by white Jewish people in Minnesota, um, you know, it, it wasn't always great. So, um, so, uh, anyway, that story, fantastic. Um, I'm also really looking forward to, actually, I think she's watching, but, um, Amparo's, uh, book, uh, Blaze Draft Games. Yes, it's Dragon. so good. I read it recently. I'll just say that. It's so good. I'm so excited about that one, Puerto Rican Dragons, which is awesome. Um, I, I also like Raul the Third like is really doing some phenomenal work um uh just like exploring mexican culture and you know border life and all that stuff and his illustrations are amazing um i don't know there's just so many there's so <laughs> like, many yeah. yeah and just hearing um both of your answers i also thought of because you were talking about how you really enjoy um mixed race story about stories about mixed race kids um i don't know if you read it but you should definitely read lupe wong won't dance oh that just came out yes it's, yeah it's yeah, it's so good. It's so good. It's about um, a young girl who's both Mexican and Chinese, and it's awesome. So you should read that one. Um, Anika? 
So I love 80s culture, anything 80s, and um, <laughs> Ghost Squad by uh, Claribel Ortega. Oh my gosh, that was just like my, <laughs> it was my favorite things in a book, you know? <laughs> like I just, and I know that she's a big 80s yes. fan and like Ghostbusters was influential. And um, so I read that to my daughter. We, that was our read aloud over our summer vacation. And mm -hmm. um, we had so much fun with that. Um, I'm just, I'm in middle, it's the summer of middle grade. Um, all the books you mentioned too. Like, I was like, yes, I want to do that, that thing. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, a Friend Divided in Estos mm. Cisneros. So that book just broke my heart and put it back together again. And I just, what a debut, knocked, knocked me over. Um, what else am I reading? Uh, I just started Furia. <laughs> and so that, like, I just got that. And it was also a Reese. Yes. Um, that's YA, but it was a Reese Witherspoon book pick, and I just mm -hmm. started it, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, I think it's just like I've, um, I either want to be like escape, this summer was about escape, like, or I just want to read writing that I, I want to like mark and put sticky notes on the pages because it just like, it just floors me. So those are just a few that I'm have recently there's so many you know and picture so books many. too i could go on like we would oh, be over right? <laughs> picture book next. No, hold back. i know i know okay let me think um wait wait <laughs> like, i probably have Michelle. it here wait wait do i have it here no oh i guess it, oh um where is it Oh man, sorry. I'm like turning around, but I wanted to. <laughs> no, I, I Carlos that. Aponte's Across the Bay. Oh, that looks amazing. So beautiful. Like it's just something. I don't know. It just it's so nostalgic to me and his, his paintings of Puerto Rico. Yeah, I do too. I don't know where it went. Somebody <laughs> took it from my shelf. <laughs> I wanted to hold it up, um, but I guess well, that's probably good. That means one of the, my kids is off reading it somewhere. Yeah, that's um, true. There's so. actually another one that's coming out soon. Coqui in the city. Coqui in the city. Looking forward, um, forward to no, as well. Is it Nomar Perez? Yes, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I um, I saw that on Instagram. We became friends on Instagram. I was looking yeah. at his art, and I was like, "Oh, he's Puerto Rican." Yeah, <laughs> I can Ooh, tell what he's oh, drawing. <laughs> um, yeah, I pre-ordered that one actually. Yeah, yeah I'm big. Yeah, nice. I, I've been trying to like when I see a picture book, and I don't. I think picture books are for all ages. You know, I think you can enjoy them no matter what age you are, but it is interesting because I buy so many picture books and I don't have that picture book age reader. You know, my, my nine-year-old is reading, you know, middle grade and uh, so, but I'm all constantly, like my picture book budget, I break the bank. <laughs> like, and Zara's book was like my favorite of last year. So yeah, yep. <laughs> yeah. I buy too many picture books too. And there's yeah. so many great ones coming out by Latinx authors too. Um, I got to read uh, Feliz, Feliz New Year, um, Ava Gab Gabriela, which is amazing. It's super, super cute. And um, it talks about all these uh, uh, New Year's traditions, like like the, what is it? El Año Viejo that they like destroy at, at, at New Year's time. Colombia. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah, Colombia. Um, it's so cool. Like we do the grapes and the, you know, you go out and with the the suitcase and but I'd never heard of like yellow underwear and yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that one. That was, yeah. Yeah. That was just kind of cool. Um, yeah. There's just so many really great books. And then you burn them. Uh, yeah. You, burn you get that. to burn them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, um, I love everything that Margarita Engel writes. Um, you know, I stalk her and, you know, I just want to be like her. So, you know, one day maybe, you know, in the different future. But um, I, I love her books and I always try to, you know, to read them. And it's always actually with Enchanted Air that I I think I, I kind of, you know, I gave myself license to be emotional, you know, in, in my books, you know. So, because, you know, I was trying to find my voice and when I read that one and I was like, okay, you know, this is, you know, yeah, this is such an amazing voice and it helped me find my own voice writing too, you know. So I don't know, it's kind of weird to explain, but but that was a book that for me was, wow, you know, yes, I want to write like this, you know, and I want to use my voice to the full uh, volume of my voice, you know. So I gave permission, uh, I gave myself permission to do that. And um, I have a, 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 a nine-year-old and she reads a lot of picture books and I do too. I love reading picture books and I always recommend adults, you know, go for the picture books, you know. So uh, I usually go to a library and just, you know, I just go and pick, 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 
pick here for all the from all the shelves, you know, and I get a stack like this and I come home and I read them, you know. So yeah. I don't care who they are from or whatever, you know, I just read those books. And from those books I have some favorites, obviously. Yeah. But you know, but I usually just want to read. And I I honestly I, I do want to boost my Latino people always all the time. But um mm -hmm. but you know, I usually don't care who you know who I'm reading. I, I just want I, I just eat books, you know, so I just read them. It doesn't matter who they are from, but um, but from Latinx uh, writers, uh, you know Margarita Engel. I love Lulu de la Cre, uh, Lucy Source. It's beautiful, beautiful. It got me in tears, mm -hmm. just like uh, um, um, the kindness book, right? Mm -hmm. um, Jacqueline Woodson. I'm horrible with titles, oh, you know, just like that book. They um, oh, each each kindness, kindness. each kindness. Yes. yes, just like that book. It reminded me a lot of that book that I. Actually, the first time I checked out uh, Each Kindness, I remember I tried to read it with my kids. I couldn't because I was just bawling, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what's wrong with you? And I couldn't. Um, I couldn't. It was beautiful. And Lucy Source has that same, you know, kind of feeling. So I, I just love it. I think it's adorable. And I love also Ephraim Divided to. Uh, my daughter just read. Well, and I did too. Uh, Zombies don't eat vegetables. Uh, oh yeah, Jorge Lacera, and you know, I, I don't, I'm not very much into the creepy stuff, you know. So I was like, hey, you know, the eyeballs and stuff. <laughs> but you know, the story was so delightful, and the illustrations were so much fun that I said, okay, well, this is you now I can read creepy stuff uh, too. So I'm you so know, glad you mentioned that one. That's yeah, a really no, fun one. It's super super fun. So yeah, there's so many, and uh, you know. Kind of hard to remember at this moment i'm going like okay um i thought of a few and then you know of course i forgot but uh, <laughs> you know just uh, uh, to people watching just go find latinx people on on, on twitter mm -hmm. and you know and then you'll find wonderful books because people are not going to be disappointed with it you know with the quality and talent that yeah. the latinx community is bringing to the table Amen. Also, there's so much poetry, I feel like, in Project's mm. books. Well, they call me Güero. They call me Güero. Oh, well. yeah. Mm. Spread it and it, it, yep. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were about to, like, start wrecking poetry. <laughs> I could. I, like, I could. I mean, uh, it's not really. You're like, so. <laughs> you're like, I suddenly don't know anything. <laughs> oh, God. Jessica Galdado, uh, Salgado. So good. But not. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's going to be on a panel later really? with, um, oh, I gotta get into that one. with Adriana from Boricua Reads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm be watching that. <laughs> Can we shout but, out Adriana's um, book list that she's got going? If I don't yes. know if she's watching. Um, I have a link to it on my website. It's just, you know, extensive from board books. So if you yes. are looking for, you know, new or upcoming, go to her website, which is what yes. I don't have it on me. Do you know it? It's a, uh, um, it's, Boricua Boricua Reads, it's just called Boricua Reads, right? Boricua Reads. But mm -hmm. uh, it's just like, I was like, wow, it's all here. Poetry, you know, yes. young adult, middle grade. So if you if if you say, oh, I don't know what to read, she's got you. Yeah, lies, <laughs> lies. Just go yeah. to Boricua just, Reads. Just go to Boricua. You want to spend a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Or you can get at the library, you know. Library. Yeah, library. It's good. Good. Place a lot of requests. Fantastic. Yeah, put it on hold. <laughs> That's what I'm doing this year. I'm I'm just getting them from the library, you know. Um I you know, otherwise I'm going to bankrupt my family. So, you know, uh so I go to the library and I if they don't have it, you know, they will buy it, you know, for the community. So, you know, I think that's our it's a really good thing as well. And there are several uh library systems so you can request, you know, at each. You know, yeah, make sure make sure they buy our books. All the libraries need yes. to in that next book. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. That, that's you know, I always tell people you don't have to if you don't have you know the means. Okay, that you know it's totally understandable. Request it at your library. You know, so they will they will do it. So that helps the authors as well. And it helps the yes. community to write because then it gets out yes. the community and lots of people who don't aren't going to buy the books can access it. So well, it it, yeah. forward. it tells the librarians and the people that are buying books uh -huh. that people want to read books by Latinx authors. That's yes, exactly. Yeah, and if you if they have like multiple requests, they'll they'll bring in more copies. Yeah, you know, to, to to so yeah, it's always good. That's very true. Very helpful mm -hmm. reminder. Yes, request all these books from your library mm -hmm. and other books, other children's books from your libraries. Kind of like uh, all of you are saying. Um, I think that children's books and middle grade books are for readers of all ages. So 
whether you have a young reader in your life or just a young reader in your heart, I think they're perfect. And I think all of these books from all of these authors here today are perfect for you as well. So uh, that about wraps up our panel. Thank you again to all the authors for joining us and to Paula and the Latinx Heritage Book Latinx Heritage Month Book Fest yes, for hosting all of us. Um, if you want to connect with any of these authors, learn more about their work, check out their books. Like I said, all of their links are available in the description below. So be sure to give that a look. Uh, thank you again to everyone watching for joining us. I hope you have a great day and we'll see you later. Bye.